Good morning, everyone. Um, well, I don't know if it's morning where you are. Um, I'm going to read some poems today. Um, but first, I want to thank um, Grafters Exchange and Margareta for inviting me um, to read and share my work um, with all of you. And I also want to thank um, Margaret Ree and Craig Santos Perez for um, years of friendship, poetry, inspiration. And it's really an honor to um, get to share a platform together at this um, at this exchange. So thank you. And I'm just going to jump right in and read some poems. These come from um, a longer work, a manuscript that is thinking about the, um, the desert landscape and its techno ecologies, as I think of them, right? So, and I, I'm, the poems move between um, deserts in the Middle East and the deserts of the California and Arizona area. Um, and then there's some, there's some other poems sprinkled into just for some relief, but that's kind of where we're going. So I'll just, I'll just dive right in and I'm going to share my screen with you so that you can um, follow along for accessibility reasons if you need to. So here we go. Okay. Revelation Desert Flow. One. I cross into the desert that has no edge. Storm desert. Desert of fences without finish. Irrigated desert. A spreading of grass differently in the desert. Floating fences patrol the dunes of this desert, splintered into all its strains, exploding desert. Two. Outside my window, a man is screaming about the desert. He is beating a tree with one of its branches. We lie in bed and listen for the vacancy that stalks the inside of our city. At certain hours, a helicopter tracks the roads behind our apartment, the roads that pass in or out from the city adjacent to this one. You know this is not a true coordinate, this city. It is an edge enfolded, the architecture of a box unfolding. Sometimes this city says bridge, but means bypass, or it says company, but means the wrong kind. In the alley that is also an exit from the gas station car wash, a man is walking. You ask if it is the same man. Can you see the branch? Three. Along the border, trains speed past infrared sensors, heat emitted, time stamped, and released again to the real. I can't decide decide if abandonment's impossible or all the time now, desert flow. Is there a sequence to feeling? What is the choreography of the sun when it smashes us to smithereens? Four. From the sway of my disaster, I look reeling out at yours, simple, radiant, the color of stone at morning, revelation glow, nearly the sky's color. Okay, I'm gonna share um, a different form of poem now. This is part of a long series um, called Desert Television. A body runs, a body heaves itself, over whatever it finds as obstacle. A body drops in real time. If anyone is sighted, seen furiously on the move. If anyone drifts on screen in a gray raft, crossing light gray water. This trouble moving makes. How to distinguish this captivation with transmission from selection a field made up of shifting intensities, this running against everything that does not run. So I should say some of these poems are really thinking about um, 
the intensive kind of surveillance regime in the desert um, and what we can think of as kind of soft border technology. Um, so we all know about building the wall, but there are all sorts of other um, border technologies that are reshaping you know, the, the desert as we know it. Event Horizon. And the photographs in this poem come from Trevor Paglin, who is an amazing photographer who uses um, distance photography techniques used to photograph stars in order to photograph um, black sites and other kind of hidden um, sites of US power. And you can see that um, with that kind of sensitivity to the lens, there's a lot of, um, you know, the images that are produced have kind of contained this very disturbed mirage-like quality, so I'm interested in that. Event horizon. You ask me to be raw body to your mediation, object to your objectivity, clandestine to your viewpoint. You are merciless precision, a laser show, a light brigade, total illumination. I am gone dark, universe beyond your orbit, rain shadow to your Sierra, herbs crushed underfoot, self-cooling stoma to your thermal image. Outside the wire, I must go, burrow beyond darkness, enter further obscurities, devour light. You become black sight, secret box, bag of tricks. You insist I be the leak to your container store, give the slip to your cul-de-sac. I am become image to your real dirt. You are a secret power, hidden imperium. Let the poem be heat shimmer, run off imperial roads loop of the sky, run backwards. It's like television, the early days when the antenna bent obliquely to its signal. Two episodes in and you've wrangled a man. The trick is to capture difference over time, another word for history or its undoing. La Migra's understaffed, overworked, but our new system has opened for your participation. The tighter the feedback, the stronger the law. Sometimes the body is a leaking smudge, or it gathers like a cloud near an object of interest, or it moves inside a row of bodies, single file, from right to left, proceeding across the screen. This poem comes from, um, in high school, I used to work at a postal center on the San Isidro Tijuana border, um, where uh, that was run by the father of my best friend. So this, this comes from the time when I was working there. Sometimes while running letters through the postage meter or fixing a label to a box, a storm of sound bursts outside, a flapping of wings against cardboard, a wrestling apart of rushes into which soft animals dart. It passes quickly, this border weather, little systems of seizure and flight. The shop had no window on its back wall, but at night in my dreams, I see men, women rush down the alleyway, their pursuers closing in as tiny slips of paper tumble from their pockets. What if your psyche is composed of what doesn't belong to you? What if it belongs to you? In the dream, I was to walk on gravel as lightly as possible, then sand, then through quickening water. To find the edge of the desert, one must perch high on a mountain, ransack the aerial.
I'm just checking the time because I don't want to go over. So, okay. Crossing over. In the desert is a line, and if you cross it, a new line appears, inscribed on the body. And if you learn to, a new wrinkle forks, the pink of your tongue. And if you train it, another comes. Soon you understand you must expect this sequence. It's shattering again. A stick you learn can always be broken once more. And you are made from infinity. Drove west from Albuquerque in a lightning storm. Gnarled, chapped trees catch fire. Music jumps, leaps on the car stereo. We stick our hands out the windows, scream, catch us if you can, snatch the first wet drops. Later, stopped at a bodega, a woman in the bread aisle asks, what kind of Indian are you? Right place, right time, as in, it's not just the body we're after, but how and where it comes to appear. This is how a drone operator perceives 30 pine nut harvesters to be terrorist. Both kinds rest in scrub at day's end. Both kinds sleep in heat leaking tents. So this poem um, actually comes almost entirely from found speech, um, found language that I've um, rearranged from interviews with drone operators um, from the uh, Creech Air Force Base in, in Clark County, Nevada. So I've kind of pieced this together um, from, I don't know, probably like 10 or 15 different sources. Um, where you get a sense of what life is like for these, for these drone operators. To intimately know from afar, to careen into intimately from afar, to watch closely, to hunt, to stalk, to be seen and still, to hunt, to arrive, to be occasionally seen, to log the hours to day after day, to run just under the red, to know where you are and what's surrounding you, to know intimately from afar, to coordinate with competing fields, to debrief in the afternoon over buffalo wings and counsel, to feel and know and hunt intimately from afar, to be seen and hunt, to become known and hunt what might be followed with openness, with familiarity. So just keeping an eye on the time again. So I think we have time for one, one more poem. So I'll end with this and it's, um, a kind of funny story behind this poem that I'll share with you. So the photograph you see here is um, in the middle are my my uncle, um, Salim, and, and my grandmother. And this photo was sent to us um, by a family friend who saw it on sale at a famous market, the Thieves Market, Chor Bazaar in Delhi, um, where it was being sort of sold as a memento of historic um, India. So um, it's a funny way to kind of encounter this po poem. And it made me start thinking about um, my family's history of migration that has spanned, you know, three countries and um, three continents. And um, also got me started thinking about the phrase um, anchor, which is an anchor baby. Um, and so you'll see that, you know, in some ways this poem is the beginnings of a, of a project that's trying to rewrite how we think about migration. So this is the first um, kind of starting poem in that series. Nest. Photos of my uncle for sale at Chor Bazaar. Salim wears a garland of paper jasmine. 
stands before an ocean liner. His body blots the ramp out. His body is a ramp. His sisters, brothers climb to America, which is a parking garage in Milwaukee where he works security, an ark where children will be born, sing, fall into the sea. Actually, and I just want to pause for a moment to say, I, I forgot to say something important about this poem, which is it's also part of a series that's thinking about um, queerness and reproduction. So, um, and thinking about how my child um, is, um, taken up and not taken up by this family history and this history of immigration in different ways. So it's kind of thinking through that as well. Okay. My uncle and his sisters and brothers borrowed a car, drove to the interior where school was, took classes in broadcasting, worked small jobs, flirted with Japanese students, students from the Philippines, a French nurse, also a student who my uncle married. Now the country closes to those who leave it, closes like a tunnel that requires amnesiacs, sleepwalkers to assume ancient postures. The ritual is repetitive stress. To travel a line means to make the route recurrent to take what's been known, oceanic, make it regular. To travel a line is to give it the precision of birds, their accurate return to breeding grounds. The children and the children's children disembark. Introduced to his great niece, my uncle struggles for a way to relate to this child. Her red tunic embroidered with mirror work fractures 1,000 ships from one. His hand nebulous stutter in the scatter of light. Well, thank you so much for um, sharing these poems with me. And I look forward to hearing uh, and witnessing everything else in this conference. So thanks again. Right, so let's return here. So this is new for me, here are my hands, getting used to this new way of teaching grafting. Um, so, right, so um, I'm happy to share also resources for where to get stuff. Um, probably my favorite company to buy from is AM Leonard. They have a lot of nice, um, nice tools. Um, so let's take a look. So I think in one of the images I showed you the image of a grafting tool. Um, so I've got a couple here. This is, this is a grafting tool. And then I've got an older one here. Um, basically, basically the same. Um, and these seem really great at first, and then as you keep grafting, you start wanting to have more control. But I'll show you. So there's a couple of nice things about this tool. So firstly, it um, has like a like a snip aspect right here, so you can cut a branch to begin um, with with this snips up top, and then it's got this um, sort of wedge shaped cutter in here and you can kind of see it. It's, um, yeah, it's this wedge shape and then you rest the branch on here and I'll show you that in a second. And then you just cut down and it cuts a perfect wedge for you. So that's pretty nice and I've, I'll show you, I've got an extra. So this is what the wedge looks like. Um, so that's pretty nice because you've got a perfect match for your host branch and for your branch. The, the downside is it doesn't really stay in place that easily. So it can be a little frustrating if you're reaching up high and trying to, to get your branch in place. It can be a little tough, but I'll, 
give a demo of using that tool in a moment. Um, then you can also just use like a floristry knife. Um, this is this is a knife that florists use, and it also works great for grafting, for doing a wedge graft or a whip and tongue graft, which I'll demonstrate today. So that works great. Um, you know, box cutters, box cutters work great. And I don't know, Marissa, when um, when Sam did the tree of forty fruit at Pioneer Works, did did he use a box cutter? Is Marissa there? Okay, I got yes. Hi, Margarita. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, uh, Sam uses box cutters and yep. uh, electrical tape. Yep, it tape works. They work great. So, um, right. So, so the reason I was invited to this event was because um, Sam Van Aken, uh, also a grafting artist, installed a tree of 40 fruit at Pioneer Works, which if you're in New York City is worth paying a visit to. Um, so Sam's an incredible grafter, really experienced, and his his grafting tool of choice is a box cutter. So um, so they they work great. So um, and then of course there's the official grafting knife, which I've been using lately. Um, so you can see it's a little thicker than the the florist knife, and then it's got this um, this sort of out outer um, uh, thing here, which is used for bud grafting, which is a whole other kind of grafting that's done in the summer. You graft a, a bud to a tree. So a range of different options from sort of um, DIY to more fine-tuned that you can use for grafting. Um, so then you can also, you know, it's also sometimes a good idea to have a pair of snips with you if you want to do some pruning. Um, uh, or you know, even like a pair of scissors or a smaller piece, a uh, smaller pair of snips to cut your tape or to do some fine-tuned stuff. And uh, these are these are things that are good to have in the bag. Um, I always have some rubbing alcohol. Uh, I know that those of you that got a kit got um, some alcohol prep pads. This is really good for sterilizing your tools from tree to tree, so that you're not you're not um, carrying viruses or um, bacteria from from tree to tree. So you just, yeah, you always want to sterilize your tools as you go. So you want to bring that and maybe some paper towels. Then um, having some rubber bands um, that act as additional support to your graft. Um, always want to have a few of these, or you can you can buy these like pre-cut rubber bands from A.M. Leonard. Um, so those are good to have. Um, you can have grafting, uh, grafting wax, which I haven't really been using lately. This has like been at the bottom of my bag. It's a little gross. Um, and then of course you want to have your tape. Um, so this is official grafting tape. I've been in the habit of using it lately, but um, like Marissa said, you know, uh, electrical tape works great. I tend to wanna, if I am using electrical tape, I wanna make sure to take it off after the graft is taken. The nice thing about using grafting tape is that it just kind of falls off. Um, um, the, the branch will just push it off eventually as it grows. Um, so good grafting tape, you know, it has a stretch to it. It's really nice, it kind of, um, it, you know, you, you sort of pull and it sticks to the branch as you, as you wrap it. Um, and I get this from Anne Leonard. So let's see, then you can have, um, also you can have labels and these can be, right, um, you wanna be a little more careful if you're doing this on the street. Um, sometimes in the past, we've always sort of, had these different strategies for how to remember what we've grafted. Um, for a while, we used bread bag ties. If you got a kit, you got these, which you can use to label if you're doing it in the backyard. Um, so that's an option to take with you. And then, of course, you want your scions. So um, I got some lovely scions from, from Pioneer Works. I got some pear 
and some plum. It's really exciting. I also um, recently got some quince in the mail and some medlar, which I'm really excited about. And quince and medlar are really good for for hawthorn. And Marissa, you're you've been grafting hawthorn, no? Yeah, I took some uh, root cuttings of some hawthorn trees uh, over here in Red Hook. And nice. so, yeah, folks are interested in getting some, getting access to some of the um, baby hawthorn trees. I'm happy to share those and I'll put my info in the chat. Amazing, yeah. thank you. Yeah, so I should, I should also say that um, in, especially in New York, you see a lot of um, hawthorn uh, in in the urban environment too. So I should add that to the list. So you see pear, cherry, plum, those are all ornamental. And then you see hawthorn and they do bear fruit, um, but somehow they, they're they not on the city lists of what not to grow. It's just a mystery. I'm not quite sure why, but, um, but they do take a range of interesting, it's really, they take a range of unusual um, scions. So you can graft pear to hawthorn, you can graft quince to hawthorn, apple, um, medlar. Uh, am I forgetting anything? I think those are the main ones. Crab apple, those those all can go go onto hawthorn. So it's sort of interesting. It's sort of like an ur tree. It takes a lot of really interesting, unusual varietals. All right, so I've um, prepped a few branches here. I've cut off some of the, the branches off of the, this main branch. And I'm gonna show you how to use the grafting, this official grafting tool first. So um, we're gonna imagine that this is the host tree and the cyan wood just to get the initial, initial cut and attachment here. So, um, you know, generally I'd say when you're thinking about where to graft, you wanna graft closer to a host branch than farther away, like up the branch. So you wanna think about getting it closer, closer to the main branch um, so that the resources of the branch don't have to travel far in order to make the connection. I'm gonna do it right around here. Um, and you wanna do it, you wanna make your cut in between the buds, right? You don't want to cut right, right where a bud is. You want to sort of do it in between the, the leaf buds here. And then hopefully you can see here, I'm resting the branch onto this little um, indentation uh, on this orange wheel part. So it's rested on there. And then I've, I've started to close down my tool. I started to squeeze the handles here and then I just double check to see if it's centered on the branch and then I give it a cut. And then with any luck, we've got, we've got our cut here. Yeah, it didn't go all the way through. It's okay, we'll sort of. All right, so. This is a young branch, so it's a little bit hard to see, um, which is okay. But you can kind of see here that um, right underneath the bark, there is this thin layer of green and that's called the cambium layer. And that's really where you want to make sure that both the host branch and the cyan wood are connected. So um, you wanna make sure that that the scion and the host branch are exposed to as much of each other's cambium as, as possible. And in fact, it's important, like it's less important to make it a perfect fit than it is to make sure that as much of the cambium is connected. So then we're just gonna pretend that this is a different tree and we're gonna connect these. So if I was actually grafting, I'd be making two cuts, right? I'd be making a cut onto the host branch and then I'd be making a cut onto the scion. So I've made the connect and then I need a piece of tape. 
So I'm just gonna grab a piece of tape here. This is where it's handy to have somebody with you. They can hand you the tape. Um, and then we want to start wrapping this branch. And like I said, the biggest danger of a graft not taking is that it's going to dry out. So you really want to give a nice seal to your graft. So you start, start beneath the graft. And then you can see I'm sort of pulling, sort of stretching the tape and then pulling it up the branch. So I'm pulling it, stretching it and then pulling it around. And I love this tape because it really makes this really nice seal. So definitely wanna go all the way around the branch, but then if the scion you have also has an exposed top, sometimes I just go, and again, you wouldn't do this with electrical tape, but you can do it with, with this kind of tape. Um, sometimes I just wrap the whole thing so that I'm, I'm sealing that top and preventing it from, from drying out too. So I'm just going, and you know, you might be worried about these buds, but they're just gonna poke right through this tape. So then, so I've wrapped my, my scion here. And then um, the last thing that I wanna do is just like right around where the graft has taken place, you wanna probably add a uh, rubber band, just a tie to sort of give it some extra support. So um, now, like I said, the buds are gonna come through here. The, um, this, this tape will fall off. Usually the rubber band falls off too, but you, you wanna make sure that it falls off. You don't want um, to leave the rubber band on because it will sort of um, choke the tree. Eventually it'll make, make the branch sort of strangely formed. So you wanna make sure that comes off. Um, and you'll know if the graft is taken um, in about six to eight weeks. Um, the, the graft, the cyan wood will either um, um, look healthy and, and buds will start coming out or it'll be dried out. Um, it'll look sort of raisinish. So that is, um, Grafting with the grafting tool. I thought I'd just show you a wedge graft with, with the grafting knife quickly. And just to say there's all kinds of, of grafting techniques. You can go really deep with grafting. Um, so uh, yeah. Um, you know, there's very thick books written on all these different kinds of graphs. It's really, really fun. So I'm just showing you a few techniques. And these are techniques that work especially well in, in this sort of tactical urban context. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, take my knife. And without, I'm really not going to put any pressure here. I'm just slowly rocking my knife back and forth. And um, I'm not putting any pressure because once you start putting pressure, it starts getting dangerous. So um, just slowly moving back and forth. And um, sure enough, the wood starts to give. And I start getting to be able to move my, my knife deeper deeper into the branch here. And you generally wanna go maybe three quarters of an inch. We've got another good question. Um, yes. There are a few different wedge shapes provided in the kit. Um, yeah. Is there a specific shape better for different branches? You know, the, um, the more sort of defined like narrow wedge might be useful for thinner branches. But besides that, I don't really see much difference. Okay, so I've got, got this knife down into this, into this branch pretty far. I think I've got far enough. I'm just gonna double check that. Yeah, that's pretty good. So, and then with the scion, right? So this is the scion, this is the host branch. With the scion, I just want to 
get um, sort of an arrow pointed down on two sides. So yeah, something like that. So I've just um, stripped off two sides of this cyan wood. And um, this is a little bit better for seeing that cambium layer. If my camera can focus on it, there's more of a really distinct green layer. So this is a good example too of like, you know, it's not a perfect match like the grafters tool gives you, um, but I'm, I'm able to match up enough of the cambium layer on two sides here to, um, to be able to make a connection. So here I'm just um, sort of pushing in the scion and um, uh, into the into the to the host tree that I've made a slice into. And yeah, just got the cambium connected as much as possible on both sides there. And it, you know, it's it's a little messier, but it works great. Um, and yeah, so then again, taking some tape and starting beneath beneath the graft and just pulling and stretching, wrapping it up, making sure it's nice and sealed and putting some good vibes into it. And and then again, tying off the graft. Like so. So um, yeah, more questions. Are people, is anybody doing it alongside wanna show their work? Let's see, I could also show, there aren't any questions. I know we're short on time, but well, what do you think, Christina? Should we try to do some networking or should I show one more graph type? Um, we've got one more question. Are there any biodegradable tape options? Yeah, so um, this is at least part paraffin, um, but you can, you can look for, uh, I think 100% paraffin. You could take a look, try to find that. It's a great question. Um, yeah. And um, how can we tell what types of scions work with what types of trees? Yeah, okay, I'm gonna stop demoing and um, answer that in, in detail. So let me just return here to my camera, my camera view. Okay, so um, the best thing to do when you're starting is to um, to do you know the sort of basic, most obvious, which is to um, to think about um, doing you know fruiting cherry onto ornamental cherry, um, to do fruiting plum onto ornamental plum, um, and fruiting pear onto ornamental pear. Um, uh, but then you can get fancier. So um, with pear, you probably generally are going to stick with pear, although you could, uh, you could try a medlar or a quince on pear. With plum and cherry, they're in the stone fruit um, genus. The, it's called the prunus genus. And those are all really uh, interchangeable. So you can do um, cherry onto plum, plum onto cherry. You can do nectarine onto plum or cherry. You can do almond if you're in the right zone. If you're in the right climate, you can do peach, apricot. Those are all stone fruits and they're all pretty interchangeable. Although it's generally thought that plum is the best host to different kinds of stone fruit. Um, then um, 
Then you can think about hawthorn, which is another street tree, um, which is um, a good host. Sorry, I'm realizing my camera's a little smudgy, but um, hawthorn is a, a good host for quince, for pear, for um, medlar, for apple. It will take really a range of different things. And um, you can see that there's different leaf types for hawthorn, but the image behind me has one leaf type. It um, is a little more complex and um, it has usually has a white blossom in the spring, but sometimes you'll see pink, pink blossomed hawthorns. Um, and what else? So sometimes you see crab apple, not very often. Up here in towns, you'll see crab apple. And crab apple can take apple, it can take pear, it can take medlar. Um, medlar is sort of an interesting uh, fruit that you don't see very much, but I've been getting really into. It's sort of like a, a tangy apricot. So yeah, I would say, um, let's see. Um, the curious about how the fruit uh, taste has in, has ended up growing in city soil. You know, it's it's really fine. Like by the time the um, by the time the fruit, you know, by the time the water and sugar get to the fruit, um, you know, you don't have to worry as much about city soils um, with with trees as you do with with something like a low growing vegetable like kale. Um, so I haven't noticed noticed any difference. Uh, you, you do have to worry about, you know, maybe, um, you know, uh, exhaust landing on on the tree. So that could be something that you think about. Maybe you choose a branch that's going into the sidewalk that's sort of protected by other branches. Yeah, so yeah, thinking about contaminants and highways, right? So maybe you choose a protected area of the tree, something that's sort of yeah, sheltered by other branches, right? And so the, the short term, it's a concern, right? But then you also have to, we also have to think about, well, we're trucking in all of our, all of our fruit and vegetables from outside of the city, which is contributing to that exhaust. So at some point there has to be some sort of shift in thinking in my mind about what, what we do in cities in terms of, um, yeah, being sustainable, resilient. Yeah, different regions of the US. Um, so if you're in um, Southern California, you can think about working with almonds, right? You can graft almonds onto stone fruit, onto ornamental trees, uh, ornamental plum, ornamental cherry. Uh, I was down in San Diego doing um, some grafting work with CSUSM last year. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of ornamental pear pears out there. So we were grafting um, ca calorie pairs. So that's something to keep in mind. And there are some really good scion exchange. So the California Rare Fruit Tree Growers web website is something else that maybe we can pass along. Um, they have all of the scion exchanges in California are listed through that website. So you can find some really good resources through, through them. Let's see. Can you graph citrus? You know, you can, but um, so so this is something to know. Uh, all of our fruits that we get, or almost all of our fruits that we get from fruit trees in, in, the, in commerce are grafted, right? So every Macintosh that you've ever had is from the same tree because um, uh, apples are heterozygotic. So if you reproduce them by seed, you always get a different apple. So if you want to control the kind of fruit, then it's grafted. So every apple, every citrus, you know, like uh, mandarin oranges, it's all the same tree. It's really crazy when you think about it, it's all the same organism. So, you, you know, so orange tree, yeah, they're all grafted, but uh, for, for us, for, so you can do it, you can graft it. For us, you know, we, we don't see ornamental citrus, so it's not something that I've done a lot of, if that makes sense. But yeah, you can do crazy Franken trees with like lemon and orange, different kinds of orange. Um, it's pretty fun. 
Also. Yeah, and the, so one of the things that I love about gra grafting too is that it's like this kind of queer propagation, right? It doesn't rely on reproduction. It's, um, but it's sort of spreading genetic material and um, abundance through this sort of queer way of, of propagating. Sorry, you had a question? Oh, I just want to ask about pawpaw because there happen to be yeah. there happen to be a few trees I I know of uh, in New York. Yeah, pawpaw is um it's a plant I don't know a lot about, but I'm really excited to learn since I've moved to New York. Um, you can graft it. Um, my friend my friend has been grafting them, but I haven't done it, so I can't I can't say too much about it. But there's really amazing varietals of papa, and they have a really interesting history and relationship to indigenous communities in Northern America. So it's definitely like a food forest plant. And I think you can just like Thank shake you. them, right? And the and the fruit will just come down. Like that's generally the har harvest method. No, yeah. No problem. Oh, and it um, looks like Alice has a papa. Nice. So um, we, I think, are at about time. But if folks want to share where they are, if they're looking for folks to graft with, um, feel free to keep using the chat for that. Um, and I see, um, Hannah, you found the, our map, um, the falling fruit map, which is, a, that's another good resource. Um, so if you go, go to the gorillagrafters.net um, and click on the link to the map, you'll see that we've collaborated with falling fruit to um, map, the, their, their whole project is to map the urban harvest. And, um, and they've made a section for the gorilla grafters to map graftable trees. So we don't share where we've grafted, right? Because that would put the tree under threat, but um, we do share where it's possible to graft. And so this is a community-based effort. If you know that you have graftable trees in your neighborhood and they're not on the map, you're invited to share them. Um, yeah, but this can also be a great way to start out to um, try to find where, where there are trees to graft and to start your um, process of identifying trees. And um, New York City Parks also has a pretty good map of ornamental, I mean, it's, you know, bigger, it has other trees as well, but you can find out where the ornamental street trees are there too. So great. Um, yeah, and so Marissa is sharing also that if you want to receive some cyan wood, we're sharing um, just um, keep in mind this this link to our grafters exchange form. Um, we have we actually have quite a bit of cyan wood to share. So if you're interested in medlar and you live near a hawthorn or a crab apple, I'd love to share you with some with you. Um, we also have quince, pear, plum, cherry, and um, free free of charge. It's weird. It's like we're so not used to it, but you can just. Um, put your name down and you'll get something in the mail, either from me or some, uh, from Marissa or from somebody in the network. Awesome, thank you so much, Margareta. Thank you You're everyone welcome. for joining. I hope you'll hang out and find someone in the chat that you might wanna craft with. And then I'll definitely be sharing the recording and everything that was in the chat um, afterwards. Awesome, yeah. and. Um, don't, uh, we'd also love to know what you've been up to. So um, we'd love, you know, call the 800 number or drop us an email or um, upload an image of your graft. We'd love to love to stay in touch. And um, hopefully next year we'll be able to do Grafters Exchange in person. So it'd be great to see you there. Keep, keep that link alive. We are More Trees Arborist Collective. We're three out of currently five members of the cooperative of arborists. I'm Jack McGuy. I'm the person who owned the business that turned into the cooperative. And I hired these two guys long ago and trained them as arborists. And then we all decided together to change the business into something that we all owned. And 
Uh, I've been working as an arborist, first as a college dropout in the 80s, and subsequently just wandering the globe and working as an arborist, and then eventually I decided that it was looking more like a career, and so I studied and became a certified arborist kind of in the early days of arborist certification, and it just naturally became a business, sort of without my thinking of it as a, as a goal. As Andrew here likes to say, you know, it, it grew organically. That's kind of the approach that I think we're continuing, is just to let our reputation speak for itself. And so far that seems to be working out. We're growing and we're hoping to attract more enthusiastic people, especially young people, especially people who aren't white and male, to our group. So far we haven't had a lot of success in that. We're hoping that, that we will. Having more people join us is something that we're, we're becoming more and more aware of. On the other hand, we are making sure that we're not ideals forward so much that we spread ourselves too thin. That's one of the other things that I think is, is kind of unique about our approach. Typically, a business owner in this field would be working 80 hours a week during a lot of the year, and we definitely don't do that. And so we're, we're keeping ourselves healthy in terms of the long term and not burning ourselves out. We don't have the capacity to do all the interesting things that our reputation and, and our organization will allow us to do yet because we are keeping a reasonable schedule. The industry standard is to break your body, uh, basically. <laughs> and your mind. And, yeah, <laughs> and um, it's a pretty machismo industry, and the work is hard. Like, there's no doubt about it. Uh, physically um, but laborious fun. and hard. And sure, fun uh, for people who like hard work. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> we like to take care of trees. We like to encourage people not to cut trees down. My lifelong goal with arboriculture is to change their point of view and help them to get along with the trees. And the motto that I came up with long ago was helping trees live with people since 1991. In addition to helping trees with, live with people, our other motto is uh, tree care for tree lovers. We are developing a clientele of people who seek us out because they know that we are not going to come and just um, try to sell them on removing their tree, which unfortunately happens a lot in the industry. It can be a money-making endeavor for people to come and use big equipment to remove big trees. Sometimes that's necessary when trees are at high risk, but what we've found is that a lot of times the risk is, is inflated, and there are ways to mitigate the risk through pruning techniques and uh, installing systems like cables and bracing to allow the tree to live longer in the situation that it's in. My name is Andrew Lin. I have been working with Jack since the early 2000s and became certified as an arborist around 2015. I'm a founding member of More Trees Arborist Collective. Just with regards to our goals of being a cooperative, you know, it's partially shared ownership, but it's also so democratic decision making, you know, shared decision making within the business so that allows like all the people who are actually doing the, the work on the ground to have a say, not just in daily work life, but also the bigger decisions around the business makes. And as a result, we, we share in the, the proceeds um, in accordance to how much we put into the business. Yeah, that's that's kind of a big way how we're how we're different we don't do a lot of advertising but at the same time we've really grown which to us is indicative of the fact that we're doing something right <laughs> and people appreciate it so that's uh, part of what keeps us going a big part of you know the work that we do as arborists is climbing trees andrew and i have been trained in recreational tree climbing training and would like at some point to take more people up into trees and give them the experience that we as arborists get. That experience of being on rope and a difference of perspective and and thereby like bringing people closer to 
trees as living things and understanding, you know, the, the structural aspects of trees when you're in it 50 feet above the ground is, is a different understanding than when you're, when you're looking up at it. Hi, my name is Christian Grigoroskos. I've been an arborist now for roughly six years, training under Jack and Andrew, and I've been climbing for uh, three years or so. Open the tree. I'm one of the founding members of the More Trees Arborist Collective that started in 2020. So today we're here at this formerly vacant lot that my family and I purchased um, through the city foreclosure list for a measly hundred dollars and a promise to take care of it and pay taxes. And we're slowly erasing all the lawn and we've planted a, a ton of trees varying from small shrubs to very tall nut trees. I call it an agroecological experiment because things are planted way too close together, closer than the books will tell you. Plus we've been bringing in tons of mulch making lots of compost, building the soil like in an extreme way to see how that affects plant growth. And I kind of want to see how everything behaves. We're going to do a little bit of uh, tree work on the, the larger silver maple in front. I want to take off a bunch of lower limbs to let a little more light into the front edge of the garden for our hazelnut plantings. We're going to eradicate a couple of mulberries because we have plenty of mulberries, they love to grow and we love them, but there's a few that are not in ideal spots. And then we're gonna do some training pruning on our black locust hedge, reduce them to single stems because we're essentially growing a fence of black locust in place, a living fence. And we're also gonna be doing some fun pollarding on, our, on the kids' uh, jungle gym trees behind us uh, by the shed to, to maintain them at a shorter height, but make it fun for the kids to climb around in. So keeping that in mind. Christian, what are you doing up there? Well, I'm removing a bunch of lower branches that were shading plant, new plantings underneath it. And like the, the typical approach would be to just remove this whole tree. Like, oh, it's shade in my garden, but it actually provides, you know, it's already here and established and we can easily work around it. Um, but it had many low, low branches that were blocking this nice, like, spring and fall light um, from getting in. When the leaves are on during the growing season, it's not as much of a concern. But, yeah, so we removed lower branches. We call that raising the canopy. And uh, I think I'm going to zip down now. So Mr. McGuy here is old school and has really only ever used the simple, the simple method, but that uses way too much upper body and core strength than I would like to use. And I used that for years, the other method. But this method basically hooks us up and then you tie this friction hitch on here um, and that's how you tend your slack. So if I want to go up, I pull it through and this friction hitch, watch, you'll see it. It gets slack there so the rope can come through, and then when it releases, it grabs. So if I pull it up, I'm hanging. Because this friction hitch does not allow the rope to advance. And then the nifty thing is this foot ascender, which allows you to use your legs, or a leg, to get up. So this grabs on in one direction and will advance in the other. So I put it through and it'll pull the rope down through the hitch and I can just cruise up simply using my leg to push down and it's way less upper body strength. But the basic idea is that there's a loop of rope and we're hanging from the bottom of the loop and we make the loop shorter and shorter and thus we go up. So that's how, that's how he's ascending basically. It's all. The two pieces of rope above him are the same rope and they're just up yeah. over a branch. So this is the end of the rope, which you make a loop on, and if not, that will not come undone. And then the carabiner gets attached to it, 
and then this is just tending, tending the slack. So, so now I'm going to push down on this, and that lets me fall, and but the, in a uh, controlled fashion. And the whole time that we're up in a tree, we're attached to this loop, and that's how we can make keep ourselves safe while getting around in the tree. And we also have this secondary tie-in, which anytime we're chainsawing, we we use this buck strap. So yeah, this as acts as our secondary tie-in to it, give us better work positioning. And it has wire in the middle of it, so we can't cut through it. In theory. But if you're chainsawing and your rope was kind of near the blade and you accidentally cut it, this would keep you from falling out of the tree. So it's a, it's a safety. But it also allows you to get in a better position to use both hands and not have to prop yourself up. It's quite fascinating how you can get around. With just a few knots and carabiners. And one of the things that's important that, you know, Christian isn't even thinking about telling you about is that we have training. We're certified by the International Society of Arbor Culture, uh, which is a science based organization to try to understand the science of trees and how they grow and basically leading up to how to do a good pruning job. And so one of the things that Christian did in this pruning that on this tree that I'm leaning against is that he made small cuts and he made cuts in a place that will cause less decay to happen, less rot to happen in the tree ultimately. And those ideas are things that people didn't know about in 50 years ago or, or even less than that. And a lot of people still don't pay any attention to it, but we're, you know, we're paying attention to how to do this work in a way that allows the trees to survive longer, spread that understanding of how trees really work. And after a certain period of time, uh, the ISA lets you wear Birkenstocks while you're working. <laughs> yeah. Next will be just bit open toed flip flops. This tree, which is a mulberry, um, it's an interesting tree to do this. It's kind of an ideal tree in a way to do this practice on. In the urban context here, it's essentially a weed. They literally come up through the sidewalks. They produce a lot of fruit and the fruit is spread naturally by wind, but also of course by birds. Christian, who, whose lot it's, this is, is interested in basically turning this tree into a jungle gym. And with pollarding, you are pollarding, you're basically turning this into like a knuckle or a fist um, that every year puts out new shoots and so it has more of a bush habit than a tree. It's done in cities, uh, I would say more so in European context, but there are a few trees here in Troy that they do this too as well. In effect, you're keeping what it wants to be a large tree small, um, so torturing it a little bit uh, if you want to anthropomorphize, but but really it's just basically trimming off every year's growth and the tree continues to get wider and, and grow. It puts on new shoots every year, but it doesn't really get uh, taller. A mulberry like this, these are, this is like one year's growth. So it'll, it'll grow between six and eight feet a, a year. Um, we're going to do the same over there with this box elder, which is another um, weed tree in the sense that they grow uh, uncontrollably in the, in the city. Box elder is, is pretty structurally poor, um, meaning they fall apart really easily. Whereas mulberry is kind of the opposite. It's a really strong, strong tree, strong wood. So we're basically building like a natural jung jungle gym. And the first step of that is removing last year's growth so that when spring comes around this year, uh, more shoots will come out. The tree will become you know, foliage will still be there and the kids can play inside and basically have like a natural court. So that's the goal. And it generates a lot of material for mulch, that's for sure. Hey, 
maybe, I don't know, there's so many decisions to make when you're cutting a tree, but you can never tape anything back on. Um, but you figure a little kid is about yay high, so maybe we'll, we'll leave this knuckle. I think our enthusiasm about trees tends to be infectious, like for the right person. It can really like sink our hooks into them and be like, yeah, you, you need a few more. You could probably fit a few more over there. Making suggestions of trees they might have not otherwise thought of, uh, especially as our climate keeps weirding and, and probably warming. We're trying out new species that have done really good in southern reaches and aren't really prevalent here. So we're trying to bring a lot more of those up here and see how they do, assuming that we'll be getting warmer and warmer. So that's been exciting, is getting more rare specimens for people to plant. Um, that's exciting for me to always see like what the nurseries have available and be like, ooh, I wonder what that looks like when it's you know, 40 feet tall. It's growing, like every year we seem to be doing more plantings and that's, um, we do a planting in the spring and a planting in the fall. Last fall we planted upwards of 50 trees for clients, which, you know, on some level doesn't seem like that much. I mean, on a, on a municipal level, cities are planting hundreds of trees, which is great. But from our perspective, you know, to have 50 clients interested in spending the money that it takes to get uh, a tree of 12 to 15 feet in the ground and having people come out and do it and then um, care for it for the next year until it's established and have that number be growing every year is indicative of the fact that it's a service that people want. We're finding that a lot of people find the value in planting more and more trees. And that's, you know, part of why we named ourselves More Trees when we were searching for a name for our cooperative. To just get, get roots in the ground all over the region. There's a lot of people that are excited about it, uh, as are we. Being an arborist, as it turns out, can be all different things. I think people think of think of it as the industry standard of being a tree worker and that it's a it's for us it's broader than that we're open to other people's points of view about what an arborist could be we love working with living things that are trees and shrubs and that are just beings and have their own sort of way of doing things and investigating and exploring that is a lot of fun Hi everyone, uh, welcome to my talk, um, Decolonizing the Orchard. My name's Oliver Kelhammer, and I'm speaking to you from uh, Loisida, or the East Village of New York. Um, uh, I'm hoping to see many of you at the upcoming uh, Grafters Exchange at Colgate University, but um, this is a little recorded talk for those of you who can't make it. Um, and. Uh, I'm hoping that I can share with you a few uh, interesting ideas that you might not have uh, thought of before. Um, so the talk is called um, Decolonizing the Orchard. I should tell you a little bit about myself. I'm an artist. Uh, I've worked a lot with plants for, oh, I don't know, since the 80s. I work a lot with what I call botanical interventions. And I'm very interested in landscape uh, and how people think about it and uh, questions of, of uh, colonialism and property and natural, quote unquote, what, what, what's called um, native and, and uh, what's called uh, invasive. And I'm really interested in those kinds of terms. And I'm really interested in thinking about um, the way we, we grow our food uh, in different ways. So I'm gonna share with you a, um, uh, just a, a keynote presentation and just sort of talk through it. Uh, so uh, you'll get a sense of these ideas. Now, this is a set of um, what I would say conjectures. Uh, so feel, feel free to disagree with, you know, I'm, uh, I, 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 they're kind of provocations. You, you may find some of these, these ideas a little bit odd or off the wall. So, um, that's that's totally fine. I'm just putting it up there, uh, hoping that some of you might might uh, 
take these ideas and kind of riff on them a little further. Okay, so just let me uh, share my screen. Yeah. Okay, uh, so the first image uh, is a typical orchard that this is in central Washington uh, near Yakima. Uh, I think it's apples, I'm not sure. Um, but this is uh, the sort of epitome of commercialized food production. And when the settler colonists came to North America, this is kind of what they wanted to do. They, they uh, uh, either through genocide or, or other forms of displacement, displaced the First Nations and, uh, and enclosed the landscape and turned it into these uh, plantations, basically. So this is uh, uh, a fruit plantation in a very arid area where there wasn't a lot of fruit growing uh, before um, irrigation uh, started to be used uh, by, by damming various rivers and whatnot. So this is contemporary uh, fruit production, contemporary orcharding on a large scale. This is where your sort of supermarket apples would probably come from. Now, um, the second slide here, I was taken in uh, California. Uh, these are almond trees. Almond trees uh, are, you know, the almonds are a big, big crop, uh, but because of, of drought, uh, uh, farmers are having to pull them out uh, and uh, basically stop almond farming in these areas. Also, this is an area that wasn't really, uh, you know, massive fruit growing area before settler colonists. Uh, you know, came in and, and started, you know, irrigating and, 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 and doing things to the land. Also, as in the previous slide, these are um, monocultures. So, uh, you know, one, one kind of uh, crop that, that is vulnerable to changing conditions. So uh, obviously it's very profitable and very easily mechanized, but, but the downside is it's very vulnerable to perturbations in climate or, you know, rainfall. <clears throat> But an orchard could also look like this. This is a kind of shrubby permaculture orchard. This uh, picture was taken uh, in British Columbia, uh, unceded uh, territory of the Clavus, uh, Sliam, and Humalco people. This is a little island off the coast of Vancouver Island. And um, this is an orchard that I established uh, using the native rootstocks. Uh, these, are, these are trees that First Nations uh, long stewarded, uh, but they're, they're part of the native ecology. And, and to those, I grafted uh, some European varieties of apples. So the idea of using uh, indigenous uh, uh, plants as a uh, scaffolding or framework uh, uh, on which to uh, connect uh, other uh, varieties is, is what this is all about. And uh, uh, trying to replicate uh, indigenous uh, uh, agroforestry systems, which, which you know, have really stood the test of time and have been largely ignored by the settler colonists. So here's another uh, orchard. This is uh, nearby to the other place. This is an old settler colonist orchard, but it, it has been allowed to sort of <clears throat> revert to nature and it seems to still be producing um, despite not being sprayed or, or fenced or protected in any way. So, uh, this is also a very interesting uh, idea. Like, what can I not do? Can, can things kind of just be left alone and still be productive? So that's a question we're going to be asking ourselves today. So that's an orchard. And this is an orchard. This is a, an apple tree that's come up from an apple core that somebody has thrown off a bridge and it's turned into an apple tree. So uh, and, and, uh, in the fall, it, it has apples. So this is an unintentional orchard, but uh, nonetheless, it's, it's an emergent orchard that has just uh, kind of come about as a byproduct of human travel and human waste. <clears throat> this could be an orchard. This is the uh, infamous, uh, we call them the spunk tree, but they're actually the calorie pear. Uh, there's a cultivar called the Bradford pear, uh, which is very commonly planted all over uh, the Northeast. It's now regarded as an invasive species. However, uh, it, it makes a very good rootstock for um, things in the pear family, and um, we tend to uh, disparage it, but it's a very, very uh, robust uh, tree that, that can stand a wide variety of conditions. And, and I, you know, it's also quite beautiful. So uh, this is a rootstock that 
although it is not a native rootstock, it's become um, uh, naturalized in a sense that it's now become unintentionally part of the uh, uh, ecosystem. It's what I call uh, part of a hyperecology, which combine native and uh, uh, or indigenous and uh, migrant organisms. So um, what is an orchard? Well, one of the first things that people do is they enclose an orchard. So they put a fence around it. So this notion of enclosure is, you know, basically capitalism 101. Uh, we want to, you know, fence things off to keep out those who aren't supposed to be uh, in the orchard, uh, including people and animals. Um, so one of the first things that uh, people often do, and I, you know, work in the permaculture field a lot, is um, you know, they, they spend a lot of money on fencing and then they bring in their expensive nursery stock and uh, uh, call that sustainable, which, you know, in some ways I would argue that's not. I, I would say that that's not working with the, the landscape and, uh, and the kind of non-human persons that are already living in the landscape. And we need to find ways to be inclusive, not exclusive with our orcharding. So, so this, uh, these deer are uh, black-tailed deer, they're kind of on the West Coast, but uh, here on the East Coast, we have white-tailed deer, but <clears throat> pretty much all deer like eating fruit trees. So, uh, so how do you how do you deal with that? I mean, obviously you want to have some fruit, uh, but you don't want to make the deer sort of um, you know persona non grata. So how can you how can you how can you strike that balance without fencing, which interrupts their migratory patterns? So <clears throat> it can be done. This is an orchard in a heavily uh, deer uh, populated area. Uh, but you have to start thinking about it differently. And so uh, in addition to using indigenous rootstocks, which deer have you know, kind of grown up with and they don't particularly like them or they're not, put it this way, they don't, they don't find them special because they're used to them. They're kind of bored of them. Uh, the way of, of working with an orchard here is, is by having the trees grow high. And so you, you uh, don't have this uh, problem with the um, the, the browse the the so to protect these trees they're just very small fences around the uh, bases of the trees to protect the uh, stems from the box rubbing the bark off uh, but really the the property as a whole is not fenced and it's 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 free access for um, for animals and well, people alike. So uh, it's a very different sort of a landscape than the fenced intensively managed orchard. Um, here's another image of the same space. Uh, so the grasses are actually uh, maintained by the deer at certain times of the year when they're eating fruit that falls, which of course we like to have them eat the leftover fruit, prevents disease. Uh, they also keep the grass down, so that reduces the need to maintain the grass by cutting it. So the deer do that for you, and they also bring in nutrients in, uh, in terms of their deer droppings, right? So they complete the nutrient cycle. All of these things could be achieved by, by not fencing the orchard and uh, paying attention to uh, indigenous um, uh, plant uh, configurations. Uh, either uh, using them or replicating them uh, or modifying them slightly without, uh, without getting too industrial about it. Um, here's another shot. Of course, incorporating some birds is always a good idea because of pest control. Um, so this is a very productive orchard, uh, which isn't fenced. Um, another image. So uh, what I'm talking about uh, working with the indigenous um, uh, plants uh, as a, a scaffold. This is an example. Uh, this is a uh, pear grafted to uh, sorbus, which is also called mountain mash. <clears throat> now there's different kinds of sorbus. Some of them are indigenous. Uh, the, on the west coast, the sorbus sicensis is indigenous. And, but then there's many that have become naturalized as sorbus occuparia, occuparia, I think it's called the common mountain mash. It's, it's, it's pretty much everywhere. So it's become naturalized. So it's become part of the landscape and it's just there and it's adapted and everything is used to it. So the idea of using this uh, as a rootstock for things like pear, the deer just are not interested in mountain ash. So that allows uh, these pears uh, to grow on something that has already been established in the ecology. And so you can see there, the pears have the sort of rounder leaves and the sort of feathery leaves are the um, 
mountain ash. So there's a graft, and I'll get into the close-ups a little later. Um, so in terms of totally indigenous plants, uh, the First Nations, uh, when, when the colonists encountered uh, First Nations uh, uh, managed landscapes, they conveniently uh, you know, neglected to uh, give the First Nations credit for what was an intensively managed landscape. Most of, uh, certainly the forested areas of, of, of Eastern North America and, and the West as well were managed in these kind of agroecology systems. Uh, although the plants were of course different from the ones that Europeans uh, were used to. So they often didn't understand the grammar of the landscape. So uh, by kind of reviving that, uh, you can actually uh, develop landscapes that are very productive and, and not, not exclusionary. So here's an example. This is a, a tree that's, that's quite common in the Northeast. This is a native crab apple. It, it's growing in a sort of swamp uh, in Massachusetts. And you see it has little fruits. These apples are, were, were part of native, the native diet before the European apples became available. There's nothing wrong with them. They're just a little small, but they're very, very well adapted to uh, conditions that ordinary um, kind of hybridized apples or apples from you know, intensively uh, orchard orchard places, uh, industrial farming would not be able to survive these conditions, but these apples can, and they're they're growing in very very wet soil. Um, so this is a close up of the apples. This fruit has been dried. Uh, you can see how small they are. There's a, there's a coin, uh, a nickel. Uh, so, uh, but they can be dried and made into uh, you know fruit leather or uh, eaten as such, uh, packed in brine. Uh, so they definitely are edible, is there's nothing wrong with these. Uh, however, um, if, if you're used to a larger apple, the trees themselves can, can be a very good kind of uh, uh, adapted uh, uh, scaffold on which to uh, uh, connect so, 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 some you know, other, other varieties without, without you know, obliterating what was there before. So it's kind of a symbiotic approach. So uh, this is the West Coast crab. Uh, it's called the Pacific Crab. Uh, the Latin name is Malus Fusca. And I've worked with this a lot. Uh, this uh, crab was, uh, crab apple was, was and is an esteemed food source for First Nations, uh, uh, you know, uh, west of, of the Rockies. And um, this, this plant grows all the way from you know, Alaska to California along the coast, it's very tolerant of salt spray, uh, you know, being flooded, uh, it, it can stand drought. It, it's a very, very tough little tree. Um, there's some evidence that it was part of the Beringian uh, flora, which, which is a, uh, a term for plants that, that you know, lived all around the Bering area from the far Russian Far East, like, you know, the Sakhalin Islands uh, and further north uh, all the way to like Kamchatka, all the way around to uh, Northern Canada and the Pacific Northwest. So the idea is that, that First Nations have been living with this plant and stewarding this plant and, and also changing the plant, like uh, selecting varieties, which, which uh, uh, were you know, particularly productive. So this is mouse who's got, so they're slightly bigger than the East Coast crab, but again, they were, they were dried or, or um, uh, kept in brine and there's various ways. Uh, but, but they are um, a wonderful tree in terms of it, their adaptation to extreme uh, conditions. So uh, you could totally eat those trees, uh, eat those fruits. Uh, but again, if you're expecting kind of a more Sort of supermarket kind of apple, you could find one of these trees and they're very common. They're growing along ditches and, uh, you know, electricity line rights of way. They're very disturbance tolerant. Uh, any place where it's kind of a little swampy, you're likely to find them. And you can, you can, you can add a twig from a, uh, another kind of apple to that or many, many multiple twigs. So these, uh, uh, have the advantage to uh, these crab apples of being a little bit thorny. They often come up in thickets of salmonberry, which is a thorny raspberry type thing. And also they have thorns themselves. So that again, discourages uh, deer from browsing them. And, and so they become a perfect uh, 
uh, support system for uh, for other apples. Uh, and plus, they they have their own ecological function, right? They uh, they're a very key part of the uh, West Coast ecosystem. Um, so this is a graft. What I mean by grafting, and of course, grafters exchange. We're going to talk all about grafting, but grafting is is basically connecting one type of tree to another using a simple join and then letting that grow together. So uh, this is a different uh, tree. It's the um, a hawthorn tree. And again, there are native varieties of hawthorns. Uh, uh, on the West Coast, there's one called the Douglas hawthorn and there's also naturalized ones. Uh, uh, the one that's common is called Critagus monogyna. So they're closely related. Um, and they actually turns out because they're thorny like the Miles Fusca, they make a very good uh, <clears throat> browse resistant rootstock and uh, that's adapted to kind of complicated uh, conditions, you know, which we're increasingly getting due to climate change. So, um, so we'll get into the, the nitty gritty of how that works in a second. But first I wanted to show you what, um, what the settler colonists may have, might have come across and, and, and misread or misunderstood. Um, <clears throat> now, this is a thriving uh, garden, a root garden uh, uh, on the west coast of, or on the east coast actually of Vancouver Island, uh, west coast of Canada. Um, and, and so this, this is a tidal area, it, you know, it gets flooded a bit by winter storms. Uh, so in the foreground, those things with the sort of silvery uh, uh, leaves are uh, a type of, they're called silver, uh, silver weed, and it's, it's a type of sink foil and it is a plant that has a carrot-like root. And this is a key uh, food source for uh, the First Nations. Uh, it's a bit of a starchy type root. These along with a bulb called camas, uh, which looks a bit like a little hyacinth actually, a little purpley plant, uh, were, were key sources of carbohydrates uh, because this, this part of the world did not have uh, grains in the way that that you know Eurasia did. So so their carbohydrate sources were few and far between. So so these these root gardens were, uh, were intensively managed. Uh, however, the settlers did not read this as a garden. They just read it as like a kind of a waste space. So that was a real misunderstanding. Now these are still uh, in in existence, and, and some of them are being maintained by the First Nations on, on whose traditional territories uh, these uh, gardens still are. Now in the background you can. See See the sort of shrubby trees, those are the Malus fusca, that is the, the Pacific crab apple. Um, so you can see this was like a guild of, of different things growing in a, in a very uh, managed but, but lightly managed landscape. It, you know, there wasn't fenced or, you know, there was no machinery. So in amongst these uh, uh, other plantings, and they are plantings, they're not just sort of random comings up, uh, were medicinal plants and are medicinal plants. And this is a very well-known medicinal plant called Lomatium, Lomatium uh, dissectum, I think this one is. And it is a very, very powerful uh, medicine for diseases of the lungs, such as, uh, uh, you know, uh, pneumonia, tuberculosis, and, uh, and, and even COVID. It, it has a very powerful antiviral effect. Um, so this was, this was cultivated by, by First Nations people as medicine, uh, and, it, and it's become apparent how, how powerful this, this medicine really is as an antiviral that works specifically on the lungs. So these are uh, part of that landscape. Um, and then when you look closer, you start to see these guilds. So the, the tree with the sort of uh, toothy leaves is the Pacific crab apple, the Malus fusca. And then beside it, the yellow flowers is a type of lupin. Uh, and lupins are nitrogen fixers, right? So they're helping this tree feed because the lupin has, uh, uh, it hosts um, uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria on its roots. So this is a guild that uh, benefits both. Uh, in this kind of swampy place. So there's a very productive um, uh, agroecological uh, system established by First Nations. And, and it's been going this way for thousands of years. This is a very old system and, and maintains production even, even when it is you know, very lightly managed. Uh, so here's a close up of the Malus fusca. So it's a, you know, a little shrubby little tree. Now what's interesting about these trees is they're very heterozygous, which means that they, uh, 
each one is a little different. Uh, so uh, they are quite variable in, in how they grow. They, they can express their phenotypic uh, nature in various ways. Some can take more drought. Some of them are shrubbier. Some of them are, are you know, the fruits are bigger. Um, so uh, this is one of the challenges in working with this, this type of a, a, a plant. They're not clones. They're, they're very individual. So some of them will behave differently. You have to sort of, you know, develop a relationship uh, and try to understand uh, whether what you want to do is, is even possible with this particular tree. They're, they're individuals, right? So, uh, which is kind of great, uh, but it makes it hard for kind of mass industrial thinking to, uh, to succeed. So here's a success. Uh, this is, you can see the sort of toothy leaves on the bottom. This is the Malus fusca, and there's a a uh, European apple grafted to the top. It's, um, uh, I can't remember what kind it is. I think it's um, a uh, Gravenstein, very likely, because I, I did a lot of those. Uh, they're quite delicious, you know, delicious apples, but they uh, delicious in taste, not, not the variety delicious. Uh, so, uh, but once again, the, the rootstock is allowed to do its thing also, and it becomes this kind of hybrid, hyper, hyper organism. So it has aspects of both because the, the uh, Valles Fusca is, is, is important. It, need, it needs to be in the landscape. So, uh, and so this is a very kind of, you know, the soil there is very bad. However, the, the tree is doing fine. And what's also interesting is the canker. You can see that little hole on the side of the tree. The Valles Fusca is quite resistant to it and, it's, and it confers a little bit of immunity to various diseases to the graft, right? So uh, the cankers, although they form, uh, don't uh, uh, develop as badly as on some of the other trees. Uh, and here's another um, image of, uh, it's, like it's a Rhode Island greening grafted to the Malus fusca. So you can form these little thickets, right? These thickets, they're very kind of productive, messy, but uh, not watered or pruned, but they just produce a lot of fruit. And, uh, pretty much self-maintaining. Now there is a fence there. It just happened to be there. And, and the mouse fusca had come up along the fence line. So instead of chopping it down, I, I uh, babied it a little bit and, and grafted some other trees onto it. So uh, it's like a win-win. So talking about chopping things down. So one of the things that people do is they see these, they're going, oh my God, it's a weed. I'm gonna cut it down. Uh, because it's something they don't understand. It doesn't have big fruit. So a lot of, you know, kind of settler colonist homesteader type people who think they're like very environmentally oriented are actually pretty destructive and they build fences and they cut stuff down. So here's an example of a mouse fusca that somebody had come across and they were trying to cut it down with an ax. Now, little did they know that this is a very hard tree and very hard to chop down. And so they gave up and you can see that they tried to wrench the tree down by, you know, twisting it and that didn't work. It just split. And I, and I came upon this tree and I thought, oh, that's so sad. It's such a great tree, the Malus Fusca, the native crab apple. So what I did is I grafted. So you could see the twigs, uh, those are suckers. So they're coming up from the roots. So I grafted those. I literally drilled little holes above that wound, above that horrible, split. Uh, I drilled little holes and I shoved the tops of the twigs in there and put a little wax on. And the twigs, the bottom of the twigs were, were coming up from the, the root like a sucker, right? So I did that, tried to do sort of what, it's called a bridge graft. Uh, it's sort of like a bypass on a heart. Uh, so I did this hoping that it would work. And sure enough, eventually it did work. And um, so the uh, root is, is pumping up far more sap to the top of the tree. The whole, the whole split has been uh, repaired. And uh, I grafted a bunch of European apples to the top, right? So this tree is now very productive. It produces, I don't know, has produced over its lifetime hundreds and hundreds of bushels of apples just by me doing this little, um, you know, tree surgery, tree, you know, tree emergency medicine. <laughs> and um, uh, so we have, and it's a native rootstock. It's growing in an area that's sort of partially submerged in the winter, very wet, not the kind of place that regular apples would do very well. So it's been a collaboration and uh, a very productive one for all of us.
Um, so this is a graph, okay? So this is, you know, we'll get into it in Grafters Exchange, but this is a, um, a, a whip and tongue graft and uh, very simple. You can sort of see how the carpentry was done there, very tiny carpentry. So the bottom here, the, the kind of very lobed leaves there, those are hawthorn, okay? So that's a very prickly tree, hence the name hawthorn. And the top is either a pear or a medlar. The medlar is a weird sort of medieval fruit that uh, people seem to like, I don't particularly like them, but, uh, but they're really beautiful. So, uh, and, and pears obviously, um, you know, come in various varieties. So this, instead of making a fence, why not graft uh, your, the fruit uh, to a prickly tree that, deers, that deer don't like, that deer find objectionable because of the thorns, right? So this is a technique, this is building a hyper organism. So, you can see there, uh, I think that is a medlar. So the bottom is are these prickly hawthorns. Now I did fence, but it's very minimal. It's just a, a little ring of stucco wire, which eventually got taken down. And uh, of course it's also much cheaper. You do, you're making these little, little rings. And then once the thing is established, you take it down and just invite everybody in, you know, come on in dear, like, you know, you know, you can come and sleep under the shady trees and uh, we're not gonna chase you away. Uh, and so the orchard becomes an inclusive space. So this is just established. You can see the whip of tongue graft down there. It's the same one that got a close up of. Uh, and gradually the tree uh, that uh, I grafted, that's called the cyan, S-C-I-O-N, gets bigger and bigger. And this is taken in the early spring. So you can see the bottom is all thorns. And so those are the hawthorn and there's also some salmon berry in there. You can see how wet it is. There's like slough sedge and uh, older, which are all signs of like wet swampy conditions. And yet this thing is like totally, you know, growing like crazy in a spot that is, you know, to say the least inauspicious. Uh, so uh, it's doing great. Uh, there's another shot of it. So then, uh, since you know you never have too much of a good thing, uh, I, I grafted pears. You can see around the base of it uh, are pears, and they're grafted to the hawthorn as well. So you've got one hawthorn, kind of you know scrubby little hawthorn that came up along the electrical lines, and I just kept jamming more stuff onto it, like pears, medlars. So it's a whole fruit market on a stick, basically. Uh, that is self. Uh, self takes care of itself, like, like it, it repels the deer, doesn't need water because it's growing in a swamp. All I have to do is pick and uh, enjoy it. So, uh, uh, and that Crataegus is the naturalized one. So uh, although this would work equally well with the indigenous uh, Crataegus um, deglassii, but this happens to be the Crataegus monogynia. Uh, they're very, very similar. Okay, so look at that. Doing like doing great, right? Uh, and really, this is uh, only a few years. Uh, this is the biggest medlar I've ever grown, and uh, because it was so happy having this love connection with with the um, the hawthorn, and they're very closely related, even though they don't look it. But they're both in the rosacea family, and uh, uh, in fact, most fruit trees are are in that family. Uh, and you can kind of mess around with with grafting uh, things that, that are a little bit off the scale in terms of relationship. Although generally as a rule, you should graft stone fruit to stone fruit and you know, pears will, will graft to uh, mountain ash or they'll graft to uh, well, obviously other pears like the calorie pear and they'll also graft to hawthorn. So there's a little wiggle room. Uh, Medlar seems to graft to almost anything. Uh, so be prepared to play, but 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 you know there are there are some guidelines, uh, but you know also um, rules are meant to be broken. Every once in a while you get lucky. Uh, okay, another shot. Now you can sort of see up on the top, uh, uh, sort of third of the picture, the the brown fruits there. Those are the medlars. Uh, they have a kind of a saucy uh, reputation in Shakespeare um, because they look like anuses. <laughs> They taste good. Uh, they taste a bit like applesauce, uh, and, you, and you have them after the frost. It's called bledding, um, and so they're very beautiful and and weird and sort of ancient fruit. Uh, and so then on the same tree, the medlar. There's the medlar on the right. There you can see some Asian pears that have been grafted to the same mess. Okay, it's like a mess, a thorny mess, but it's a very productive mess, right? So 
Uh, those are, I forget what Asian pair they are, but they're an Asian pair. Um, and there's a close up, okay? So uh, they also are compatible with the, with the Hawthorne, right? So this is an orchard, but it's not the kind of kind of capitalist model of the orchard. This is an orchard that's, that's messy, it's, it's, it's inclusive, you know, it's multi-species, multivalent, it, 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 it invites, uh, you know, it invites uh, visit visitations. There's no such thing as trespassing. It just it just does what it does, and and it's constantly renewable. So I can always stick another twig on there and grow something else, right? So it, it it's not uh, a finite thing. Uh, plus, it's a lot of fun. And there's a close up of a medlar for those of you who want to try growing one. Um, and there's the pear grafted to the hawthorn, which, uh, you know, when it was younger. So you can see the two different types of leaves there, but they are uh, more or less compatible uh, depending on, you know, varieties and whatnot. There's a pear of flowers, beautiful on the uh, hawthorn. And there's a pear of fruit, how cool is that? So this is your more uh, conventional European pear. This is a Bartlett, very common. And you could see there's a bit of uh, negotiation going on there at the graft. I mean, it's not quite compatible. There's a bit of like, eh, I don't know if I like you uh, going on, but, but it seems to work. Uh, uh, the Hawthorne is, is tolerating the uh, uh, interloper there, but uh, uh, so there is a bit of that. This is where there's no one size fits all solution. Uh, uh, these are individuals and individuals have the right to make their own decisions as to who they want to be with, right? And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So that's why what I really love about this. Uh, it's kind of like trying to be a matchmaker at a party that you know sometimes it goes wrong. Um, so here it, again is a mountain ash uh, with the feathery leaves and a, a wedge graft of a, I believe it's a medlar. Uh, very simple. And uh, we'll be looking at how to do these grafts. Uh, this is in a fenced area, but that's just uh, random. And there's a close up. Um, so quite simple. Anybody with a pocket knife can do this. <laughs> I don't know why there's so many medlars, but uh, they're kind of cool. And again, here's the pears on a mountain ash. Uh, a little close up. Now the grafts are held on when they're first done. There's any number of ways to, to make a grafting bandage. I happen to have plastic bags on hand, so I, I made a little strip and use that, uh, but it, you have to remember if you're using something with a plastic bag is to come around and take it off after the graft is joined because otherwise you'll strangle, strangle the tree. Um, better are biodegradable grafting strips. Uh, you can actually use uh, uh, fabric soaked in beeswax. Uh, there are biodegradable grafting strips available. Some people use things like cut up bicycle inner tube or rubber bands. Uh, I, you know, I always have plastic bags around them. I do remember to cut them off, but uh, yeah. Um, there's also a purpose uh, built uh, grafting tape. Now those beautiful red flowers on the top of the image are salmon berries. So they're uh, one of the key um, plants that attract hummingbirds in uh, the Pacific Northwest. So um, that is a key reason to weave them and they form a guild with the Malus fusca, which is actually growing in the background, uh, the, uh, the crab apple. So we have crab apple, uh, European apple, pear, and sorbus, or mountain ash, and salmon berry, all growing in a messy uh, multi species commons. And there's a, in the fall, the mountain ash is starting to turn, and you can see the medlar is just, just waiting for the frost. So that is basically my theory about decolonizing the orchard. I think we, by replicating and building on uh, indigenous uh, flora and also naturalized flora, we could create sustainable landscapes that deconstruct the notion of enclosure and uh, are inclusive to, uh, you know, to humans and non-humans alike that, that, that kind of, you know, uh, question the notion of property and and also this idea of sort of totalitarian farming, this idea that you need to rip everything out that was there, establish, you know, you know, uh, plants that, that are sort of, you know, from a kind of mass industrial 
farming perspective, um, you know, uh, they're almost like a, a plantation. You know, everything's like in ordered rows. It's, it's very kind of brutal. This is a much more kind of complicated and diverse uh, way of thinking about the landscape. It can be very productive. And what's wonderful is you don't have to maintain it uh, that much. Uh, once the things are growing, you just come back and eat fruit once in a while. And if, if it's not you, then other, others can just eat fruit. So it, these, these are great places for, or great, great things to do for food forests or um, you know, public kind of uh, orchards that could be enjoyed by, by uh, larger uh, numbers of people in, in kind of uh, the landscape that becomes like the commons as opposed to a private realm. So that's my shtick on decolonizing the orchard. I very much hope to meet uh, some of you up in uh, Colgate uh, in the next short while. Uh, and I'll also make sure that there's a copy of this talk available uh, as a, as a uh, file, an MP4 file. So um, I will sign off and look forward to seeing you all. Bye for now, happy grafting. Uh, my name is Greg Owens. I'm a senior forester with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, and we're here at the Earlville State Forest. Uh, one of my tasks is to manage this property. Uh, we manage it for many different uses. Um, recreation is quite a bit of recreational use. It's close to Hamilton. Uh, we harvest timber on the property. We uh, protect the water. You know, there's a lot of hunting that goes on. Uh, the watershed protection is a critical uh, value of the property. Um, uh, a little history of the site, we're at something called the Lillibridge site. The New York State acquired this property in 1932 at really the peak of the, the, the Great Depression when a lot of farms in this region were going out of business. And um, one of the, uh, so money was made available by the state legislature to acquire state properties and Earlville State Forest was one of them. But even earlier than that, um, there, much of this landscape here was in a wide open condition in the 19th century. This was cleared at that time to establish farms. And where we are right now is at a farm that, uh, as far as I can tell, was established sometime in the uh, 19th century. Uh, we have records of in 1870, this being what was called the Lillibridge family farm. And as with many farms in this area, they had a variety of fruit trees, a variety of animals, primarily a subsistence farm, perhaps with some, uh, some uh, market crops that they sold, primarily um, dairy and um, uh, you know, milk, cheese, butter, that kind of stuff. Um, but what we, what we find at, at these locations are remnants of the original farm. And we have foundation. The foundation site here is probably where the barn was cellar holes and rock walls, all these things provide evidence of, of settlement in the 19th century. And the other thing we have are fruit trees that were either planted at that time or seeded in subsequent to that. So um, what we're here, the project that uh, through Grafters Exchange that I'm interested in is visiting a number of six or eight of these 19th century sites and collecting cyan wood from trees that, again, are either original plantings from the 19th century or are trees that have seeded in since that time, collecting the wood and then grafting them onto a single tree. So what we're going to do today is, uh, this is a hawthorn tree, which wasn't necessarily, was not planted for fruit production, but um, hawthorn is as wonderful wildlife value. It produces a small fruit, uh, birds like it, uh, deer will chew on it, or browse on it. There are other, there's turkeys, all kinds of animals that, are, that uh, reside in this area and they feed on this tree. Uh, but uh, more of a, a use that people have for it is something called a living hedge. Um, and what it is, it's a, as the name suggests, hawthorn or thorn apple, as the name suggests, it has these thorns on it. You can see right there that are you know, developed 
over, uh, they've evolved these to prevent animals from browsing on them. And so what uh, people often do is they, they surround their gardens with hawthorns and keep them in a hedge form, really thick hedge with a lot of thorns, and that'll keep um, uh, browsing deer out and other animals. So what we're going to do is collect some cyan wood from this tree right here. And uh, I have one that right here. Now I should say I'm, um, I'm not an expert in this. Uh, I'm a forester by profession, but I have participated in the grafters exchange. I've gone to a, a number of workshops and learned how to um, to collect or how to graft. I, this is the first venture out into collecting the wood. Um, but m what I understand is it's the current year's growth that gets collected. And the way, let me just put my glasses on here so I can see a little better. Um, the current year's growth is apparent. It, uh, it's the end of the branch, typically the end of a live branch. But what you look for is that little scar right there. At the at, there's a branch collar right there, and that is the beginning of 2021, the year 2021's growth. And then if you follow that back, there's another scar right in there, and that would be 2020 growth. And then we follow it back again, and here's, um, there's another scar. So that's 2019, 2020, oops, sorry, 2020, and then 2021. Okay, so the thing to look for, is, again, is that collar. You want to cut that, that 2021 growth and clip, and there it is. Plenty of buds, um, robust, you know, live buds, and that's a, one thing to be concerned about, because here's an example of a, that's a dead branch. If it snaps like that, that's dead. You wouldn't want to collect that kind of wood. So looking for a branch that has put on, you know, eight, ten inches of growth, six, eight, ten inches of growth a year, and um, collect that. Now the next step, I, I have already collected a number of them from this tree, and what we'll do is we'll bundle them. Okay, this is an apple tree. Um, it's Again, probably a volunteer. Again, we're at the, this Lillibridge farm site, and no doubt they had planted apples at that time. This 1850, 1860, no doubt they planted apples at that time. Um, most likely, I don't see any that appear that old, but many of those trees probably seeded in. And from this, from my guess, this one right here. This tangle is an apple tree, but also growing into it, through it is some uh, some grapevines. So this is ultimately what leads to their demise. That they get the the apples uh, get shaded out, they get um, uh, covered with vines and compete with other uh, uh, plants for light, and then they end up dying. So there's quite a few dead apple trees around here. This happens to be in an open site. Um, so we'll collect some cyan wood from this. But as I was saying earlier, this project, we're going to visit a number of different sites, 19th century farm sites, and collect cyan wood and graft those onto a single tree. And I got that idea from uh, a presentation at the Grafters Exchange from 2019. There was a man there who had a project called the, uh, the Tree of Forty Fruit, and essentially he he collected uh, cyan wood from 40 different fruit trees, from pear trees, cherry, plum, apple, uh, different varieties. So when I say varieties, there's, there are apples, but as you know from visiting the grocery store, there's dozens of different varieties of apples. So he had this tree of 40 fruit where he grafted uh, uh, 40 different varieties of fruits onto a single tree, and it's, it's on the campus of SU. And so from that, I got the idea, well, I could go around to these various farm sites and collect 19th century tree uh, cyan wood and graft those onto a single tree. It's sort of a kind of a history project. Um, so what we're going to do here is I'll collect, I want to collect some of this, um, some of this wood similar to uh, on the hawthorn. 
we want to get current year's growth. Again, uh, these are not the, your, your uh, grocery store variety trees. These are old, wild apples and don't necessarily have the commercial value as an empire or a golden delicious that you would get in the store. But nonetheless, these in particular have tremendous wildlife value. We just saw where the deer were bedding down and they'll paw around at the base of these trees and find apples and eat the seeds and eat whatever flesh might be left of the tree. Um, but a lot of uh, uh, apple, I, I forgot to mention this earlier, that the, the, uh, the Mott's company, Mott, Mott Juice Company, had a plant in nearby Balkville, New York. And a lot, I think that was one reason that many apples were planted. There was a, a local market for juice and cider. So that, uh, I presume, a lot of the apples that were grown in this region ended up at, at Mott's plant up in Balkville. Uh, but again, these, these don't have, the, they're not the, wouldn't have the commercial value that the, the apples that you would see in the store. But nonetheless, there are other non-market values that these have. Wildlife value, they have a, we're doing a history project here, so I guess they have some historical value too. Speaking of which, we're thinking about how this works. So essentially, we're using some, a uh, graft is taking the, the, the cyan wood from one tree and um, attaching it, grafting it onto another tree. And, there, and what it allows that tree to do is its vascular system will graft together. And ultimately, it will, this, this, which is now uh, the cyan wood, will be sustained by the tree that it gets grafted onto. Obviously, if you just left this alone, just it would dry out and die, but when you graft it onto another tree, it gets its, um, it, it, a successful graft will um, uh, have it, uh, it connected to or grafted onto the vascular system of the living tree, and then that'll continue to grow. All right. Hello. How's it going? Hi. Hi, how's it going? Good. Trying to get on the road today, so working towards that. Yeah, so you're in North Carolina right now? Yeah. And headed yeah. back. So you have to just go down. Yeah, to vote. <laughs> in Florida. How's the delay? There's a little delay. How's the delay? Is it bad? It's there is okay. one, so I'll just be I'll be slow. Okay. Can I introduce you? Sure, so, go for it. Thanks. Okay, so Laurencia Strauss is a non-binary, queer, mixed Latinx, first generation US artist and landscape designer based in Miami. Their participatory projects, interventions, and community-based designs have been shared nationally and internationally as experiences of mutual vulnerability and care that challenge us to adapt towards a greater sense of interdependence. Amidst social and environmental justice, their work attends to grief as a catalyst. You know, obviously, I love your work, and I love how... One of the things I love is how you're thinking about grief in relationship to tending to waste and compost and all, and the sort of disregarded. So hopefully we can yeah. get into that a little bit. Yeah, that sounds great. Cool. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to be here. So it seems like so long ago that we met. It's like a totally different world. Yeah. And time, space, definitely. So it was a year, yeah. it was about a year and a half ago that we met in Chiapas? Yes. Yeah, last July, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were at a residency together um, exploring uh, revolutionary aesthetics, especially as they pertain to ecologies and 
I remember your presentation at the beginning of the residency really well when you talked about this Mickey Mouse operations project. So maybe we can start with that and, and sort of do a survey of some of the projects that you've done with compost also. Sounds great. Okay, so you want to talk about Mickey Mouse operations? Yeah, that'd be great. Well, I love that you're doing work on compost because I've thought a lot about compost and uh, I definitely want to talk about your connection with grief, uh, which is, I haven't, hadn't really thought about that exactly. But yeah, I mean, I see, you know, like piles, like compost piles as piles of potential. And yeah, so I've just thought about that. So the, the Mickey Mouse Operations is a project that I did in Buenos Aires. And when I was there, I was really thinking about the, um, like my privilege and being able to travel uh, and visit family and, you know, just to visit another country is such a privilege. And, and so I was trying to think about how I could use that power and contribute to the contemporary issues of Argentina, of the city. Um, and so I've done other projects about maintenance. And um, as I was spending time in this neighborhood, this is in uh, Buenos Aires, it's, I was at a residency that's uh, LFEP, is, it's La Paternal Espacio Proyecto. And so when I was walking in the neighborhood, I kept seeing dog poop everywhere, or not everywhere, but often. And so I took one block and I cleaned up the dog poop. So one of the images you have is of these tools that I made. And all of these things I got right in the neighborhood, like at the local hardware. Um, and so I just adapted these tools like a scraper and a masher. And so I collected do collected the dog poop and then I was thinking a lot about just the U.S. relationship with Argentina, the history of, you know, imperialistic intervention. And so I found this Mickey Mouse cookie in one of the shops nearby and used that to make cookies out of this dog poop. So it was the grossest project I've ever done. <laughs> And that's part of, part of the reason I made the tools was so I could keep my distance. Um, and so I, I got the, I collected the poop. I was mushing the poop and it smelled so bad. I really had to add some things. So I added like, you know, uh, freeze dried coffee and sugar. Again, these are elements commonly found in the neighborhood. And I was just kind of remixing all of this stuff. Literally. Did you follow a, a recipe or it was more ad hoc? Well, it was more, well, I'm using the word cookie because I got cookie cutters in the shape of Mickey Mouse, yeah. but I really was thinking about compost. And so yeah. it wasn't about making a cookie. It was about making, I mean, okay. So this is in the larger context of thinking about gift giving because at the time, there was a situation that hadn't been resolved, which was a vulture lending situation. So Elliott Management, which is based in New York, had lent Argentina all of this money and as a vulture lender. So they went in, you know, buying the debt on the cheap and as a way to make money. And so, you know, one man was vulture lending and taking advantage of one country under the guise of giving a gift. And since then, the debt has been settled and he made 2.4 billion profit off of this debt, which is four times the, the inv initial investment that he made. But at the time when I did this project, it still hadn't been resolved. And there was this situation of vulture lending. You know, a guy from the United States lends to Argentina. And it's really about, it's not about him giving a gift as much as him taking advantage of a country in a dire situation. And so, so I was thinking about that, you know, compost as 
gift? And then how could I insert myself in the politics of that? And so that's how I started thinking about the dog poop and the gift. And so, right. So instead of just like putting dog poop in a bag and sticking it in someone's mailbox, I did a little more than that. <laughs> and um, so I made these poopy shapes. <laughs> and so, and it's under the guise of I'm doing something positive, somewhat positive, like using compost, thinking of it as a positive gesture mm-hmm. of nurturing and care. And cleaning um, up the neighborhood so, as well. Yeah, so. So, Right, exactly. So I was having a direct impact on the, the the neighbors in that block. And then I was also using the privilege of travel. So, and, you know, being a U.S. citizen, so that if I did get into trouble, I had more privilege about that. Yeah. So anyway, so I made the cookies and I added the coffee and sugar because it smelled so bad, but it didn't interfere with the decomposition. And <laughs> Yeah, and so, like, you know, dog poop, there's issues with it, but it also does, you know, increase the nutrients for, you know, for plants. So, yeah, yeah, so anyway, so I made the cookies, and then I was trying to think, okay, how could I go through customs and maybe get these through customs? And so I thought about cooking them a little bit to take away the intense smell. And so then... Making barbecue uh, like an asado is a very, it's a very common cultural, like a familial thing to do in in Argentina. And so I used this makeshift barbecue to cook them a little bit, to take out the smell. And so then I packed them up and I put them in my suitcase and I, you know, got them into the country and then I went up to New York and I put the little Mickey Mouse cookies in the planters outside of this Elliot management. You know, just a, the gesture, like the one little piece that I could do. And then what I also realized was right across the street from Elliot management is Trump Tower. And so I g- I gave some I I gave some compost there also. <laughs> um and yeah, and actually right around the corner from Elliott Management is the, I noticed, you can see the, in one of the images that I gave you is the Argentinian consulate. So it's like one block in Buenos Aires and then one block in New York. Um, right. Thinking about the financial arrangements and, you know, things under the guise of gift giving. And then I also included an image for you that's of an installation that I had of the project, which includes photographs and also the actual cookie cutter with little remnants of dog poop on it the gloves and then a video of the whole process yeah I mean it's such a rich project just you know thinking about maintenance thinking about the gifts thinking about the ways that waste um, when it gets when it gets addressed can become a kind of offering um, but also recognizing Right, like who should be dealing with the shit, right? And and who should be, yeah, who should be picking up the shit? As you talked about this, like right. cultural lender, you know, in a way creating so much shit, and then sort of, you know, there's there's this gesture of like, look, deal with it, but there's also this gesture of like, look, I made you a cookie, like maybe there's potential here in some way. Um, and also, I think Mickey Mouse, you know, the whole history of Mickey Mouse and becoming being a propaganda tool of teaching children to see the U.S. as a positive and the U.S. interventions as a positive, harmless thing. And, yeah, and the whole, you know, when you were talking about the shit, dealing with the shit, like, I, there I am seeing my cousins work so hard. And, you know, they're part of this system that has to pay back this debt to this one guy in New York right. who is profiting off of their hard labor. So, yeah, right. definitely. Who's dealing with it and who benefits from that and who suffers? Yeah. So Mickey Mouse operations, that's a term that's used in Argentina to talk about U.S. 
vulture lending? Well, you know, it's a term, no, not specifically vulture lending. It's a term that I've grown up knowing and I had to actually look it up. And I think the definition that I found was that it's like main meant that it's poorly built and Mm -hmm. poorly run. But I think it's also about U.S. intervention in Latin America, like intervening while not understanding the implications or the impacts or, you know, the true, yeah, just intervening with kind of a naive or oblivious and intentionally uh, harmful thing, you know, but not really taking responsibility for the impact of something. So to me, it's just, it's like, a, I, I don't know how to explain it beyond that. That It's just, yeah, it's a U.S. cluelessness, I would say. Mm-hmm. Or, I mean, that might be too generous, but there, that's part of it is a cluelessness. Uh, like a cluelessness and a crappiness. Shittiness. Yes. <laughs> I mean, there's so many things I love about this project. Um, you know, the like like you talked about, the maintenance aspect of this project is really about labor and, and often the most precarious, the most poorly paid laborers are the ones that are dealing with the most waste, right? Everything from, you know, uh, toxic waste to the more mundane genitorial work. And so there's this way that you're making this gesture of um, recognizing your own privilege and just making this moment of intervention to deal with the waste rather than a more precarious person. And I just wonder about that in terms of the way that we value or the way that we deal with waste in capitalist society, right? Like, you know, we're both trained in permaculture and food forestry, and that gives us a different paradigm of thinking about waste, right? We think about waste as being potential nutrient, and it's just about sort of hooking it up to the right ecological processes to to make that transformation. And so I wonder about, I mean, I just wonder about that. And I wonder about if we valued waste differently, would we also value the people that are dealing with the waste differently? Absolutely. I love all of those connections. I think for me, you know, visiting from the U.S., it was important not to insert myself in a position of privilege, but like I liked putting myself in kind of at the bottom of the heap and working there. And I, and I also think, you know, the idea of, you know, shithole countries, right? Like that term and that idea of who is a value and who is not and who's determining that. Yeah. So my pushing against that and trying to value and care for, a place that I deeply care about and, you know, respect. So, yeah, it's a great project. I mean, I also just want to know more about the smell and like what it was like to come to travel with these cookies. Like if you could smell it in the airport. I, I wrapped it really well. Cause I was afraid that there might be like dog snippers, you know, right. <laughs> you know, dog, Dogs sniffing my luggage, right. which probably would have been very confusing for the dog. I wrapped it in plastic like a lot, and then <laughs> I think I put coffee in there. And it was disgusting. Like I had to, I, I really had a couple gag reactions when I was making the cookies because I had to get close to mush it into the little spaces, like the Mickey Mouse arms and the ears. <laughs> so it was gross, and I mean I. I don't remember if I wore a mask. Maybe I did because I, I know I, it was, it was talk about endurance. It was really an endurance to use all of the shit that I had mixed to, or the compost cookies forms, you know, they still smell. I still have some left because I feel like there's future potential for these things. It, they still kind of smell. They smelled when I took them up to New York but I mean, it doesn't smell until I really open the bag and then it's still gross. But it's in the process, it was disgusting. And also just, I don't know, mushing up dog shit 
is really gross. I just feel like white contact with blue chips is possible. And I was becoming very intimate with it. So it was gross. I could kind of tell what they had eaten, <laughs> you know. Ew. So yeah, do, do you keep it, do you keep the spare ones in your freezer? No, actually, maybe that's a good idea. I just have them in a box. I mean, I think if they're in top, like two containers, right? So I don't know if they still have nutrient value. At the time, right. I did research to make sure cooking them would take out the nutrient value, but I don't know. Right. I mean. Maybe I should do an experiment. So more potential for the. I know, like in San Francisco, when we when I was living there, we were having like San Francisco has a lot of dog shit on the streets, and um, there was a lot of conversation about trying to figure out how to compost them, like having dog shit compost on every block or something like that. It's just, it is nasty, but then yeah, you no, know, I mean it is like potential nutrient if it's dealt with. Um, Maybe not for like edible crops, but I don't know. Right for some other some other crop like like lumber. Right. I mean, I put them in planters. Right, I put them in planters, and not you know. So, I no one's going to eat the food from this. Yeah, the ornamental plants. I'm sure are very grateful. <laughs> right, they don't get any dog shit, right? Because they're so <laughs> elevated. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've taken so much of your time. And I know, so this is like another commentary on this moment that we find ourselves in, but you're in North Carolina and suddenly have to go to Florida because your vote might not be counted unless you go back to Miami. Yeah, we didn't get our ballots. And um, I'm here with my mom. She's registered in Florida and I am too, because I knew that I would be near her. And so I wanted to make sure that I could vote and we weren't stuck in this in a weird situation of being in needing to vote in two different states. So, yeah, so we are registered in Florida and our ballots didn't arrive. I requested a, a mail-in ballot back in June and only, you know, a few days ago did I understand that in order for the ballot ballot that was mailed to us to be forwarded to us, I had to have, submit in writing the request for the ballot to be forwarded. So I had done all of this online. And um, so I screwed up. I didn't know, but it was very complicated. You know, I thought if I had a request for a mail-in ballot that it would get forwarded to me. And I checked with our postmaster before we left to make sure that it would get forwarded. And they assured me that it would. So uh, anyway, so yeah, that's why we're driving back. So yeah, that's crazy. So you're just going to go down and then drive back. I don't know. We're going to go down and we'll see yeah, what's happening COVID-wise and um, stuff like that. So, uh, I mean, we left in part because of hurricane season. Yeah, I didn't want to have to deal with a major evacuation. It just felt too stressful on top of COVID and everything. And so we came here. So, I don't know. We're going to go down and um, figure out what to do. So. Yeah. One step at a time. And I feel like we need to stay there and just see what's going on with the election and all of that situation before we get on the route again, you know. So trying to find stable ground and going back and forth. But it was so awesome to talk to you about these projects. I mean, yeah, it was really awesome to talk to you too. Your understanding. Yeah, your understanding has added more understanding for me. And like some of these gestures, I think that I didn't really, it, it helps so much to have, to share understandings because it just, you saw things that I wasn't articulating. And I, I really so appreciate that. Yeah, well, there's not that many of us working with compost in our art. So we should keep talking. Cool, yeah. And I definitely am going to tune in on Tuesday. Yay. I can't wait to see. Uh, yeah yeah absolutely um, well, I really hope so stay safe in your drive today and I hope everything goes really smoothly and that you stay healthy and your mom stays healthy and yeah and that you stay on stable ground thanks yeah thanks my mom turns 92 next week so oh my gosh she's doing well amazing yeah she's a trooper so just want to keep it that way as best yeah. we can yeah, absolutely. We'll give her my best right. and we'll talk soon.
Yeah, let's do that. Thank you. So Thank you much. again. This is really fun. No, Thanks. the honor's mine. All right. Talk to you soon. Okay. Have a great time on Tuesday. Thank you. Right. Bye. Bye. That was my conversation with Laurencia Strauss on November 1st, 2020. Laurencia reminded me that in order to have relationships with those that are no longer with us, we need to engage with a range of living beings beyond the human, uh, especially our friends beneath the soil who are in direct engagement with the, the once lived and the yet to live. So thank you, Lorencia. This is Margareta coming to you with hot compost over the Food Forest Network. There is a skyline, a river glistening, and if you focused on the river, you would see it, the glimmer, like one big silver fish or many silver fish swimming together, a glittery swarm. The water is polluted, and in a year's time, the fish would drop. Their silver disappeared, unmoving, undancing. There is a thick red metal bridge next to the river, the metal bridge teams with slow cars, and in the afternoon, there are fast cars. The air tells no lies, though the river chooses to betray. Colorful flags hug the round edge of the river, but no boats now because the place is contaminated. They were warned. Some didn't listen. The ducks died first. They were always there, and then... They were suddenly gone, disappeared. But now here I am, right before it all changed. The change was gradual, you know. Here the ducks still fly, the ones who can. And those that know, know not to dip or drink from the water. They are the ones who will live. Can you imagine a world without green-necked ducks, no drakes, disappeared brown, soft female ducks, no more hens, and baby ducks, sweet ducklings, yellow ducklings, all gone. To advocate for the ducks right before the end, I visited the assemblyman to lobby. He had millions of yellow rubber ducks in his office. They were in rows, covering his bookcases, desks, and table where we sat. I saw them all on the window sills. He didn't listen to me, and after I was done talking, he motioned for his aide to lead me out. The ducks would not live. Perhaps they were always already dead. This dystopian landscape is still beautiful. I believe in the apocalypse. A lover I made that day a chance encounter when I was standing at the river's edge stopped me to tell me that she loves the river changing colors every weekend. The changing colors make me feel free. She believes in pollution, and I do not. But later we would make love, and I would ignore her ignorance. I would accept and adore how knowledgeable she was with her fingers, her hands, and how she made me feel free. A bird could still land on a floating branch, and despite the bird touching the water, it finds reprieve from something. I wish I knew what. Sometimes you choose to fall into the water, then not, even at the risk of it all. Just rush in, or let something dangle, letting you feel better about the risk. If this disappearing skyline was public art for the future, the major sculpture would be the dark, immense sunko plant. From here, it looks beautiful. Though my lover loves the colors it made, she does not like how dark and formidable the structure is. But I saw how the plant shoots that were taller than the dying trees was not beautiful, 
but I was taken by it. Well, the smoke, because the smoke rises like billowing clouds, mutant flowers that are blooming, growing like orgasms from gentle than rush, rushed, rough touch. And then it billows and seems to explode all at once and disappear in a crescendo. How high can the smoke go? How do you describe an orgasm? Here it goes higher and higher and it does what it wants. And what can we say about that? It rises until no more. This is thrusting thick gas unruly and another day I watched it break apart suddenly and turning angrily into the sky. The sky is forced to absorb it and nothing, nothing is going to be green anymore. Nothing is breathing anymore. There is no pleasure. The smoke meets the sky and just before it penetrates, it helps us understand it is the sky. This is the res respite from the abject. Before it penetrates, it flowers and dips into your lungs. It shows us through pain. We are breathing and li living. Maybe this is what I prefer. If we do not have no choice, I rather believe and know. I rather accept that in some moments the world is not ending or it is happening as slowly as the many breaths I take until the end. Everything is in its natural place. The rain patters. Do you hear it? I raise my glass now. The water slowly changes color with each drop of rain collected. And I let it, I let it collect, I let it color. This will be a gift for my lover. I will bring her this glass later. I believe this is the kind of sustainability. Well, the only one I have left, as much as I can be.